heard in the morning, the climate breakdown is around the corner and, and we have to face this and we have to, uh, well, uh, change our lives uh, accordingly. Uh, with the COVID-19, we have also had a lesson of uh, how life can become suddenly interrupted. And uh, there are similarities. Uh, I don't go into details now. Uh, one thing was certainly that, that uh, we rediscovered the power of the state in a very different way that uh, uh, it appeared before. At the same time, we also have a danger that, that uh, at an economic emergency, uh, people tend to think about here and now, jobs here and now at any price. Uh, and and then the uh, old uh, pseudo uh, controversy environment and jobs would could reappear. This is why just transition is more important than ever. So uh, yes, we were talking about just burden sharing during a ambitious transition to a zero carbon economy. I have to emphasize this that uh, with, uh, because it is, uh, it needs to be an ambitious with a clear process with a clear target. And then it uh, then comes the just burden sharing. Uh, as it became a mainstream, uh, needless to say, not uh, also the 30 years history of just transition, how it became really now a mainstream, um, a concept that is, of course, now being watered down and interpreted in a thousand different ways according to people's uh, wishes and priorities, but, but there are certainly common features and certainly there are uh, different dimensions. It's a, a scale and a scope uh, issue uh, there uh, as well. So, uh, um, we have an environmental justice component that was a very long tradition. Uh, the climate uh, justice uh, component that actually became uh, a climate policy justice issue, or at least as well. That means that oh, any effort uh, we do uh, to reach uh, zero carbon uh, we need to make uh, this uh, process uh, with a fair burden sharing. That means, uh, for example, about the carbon price, uh, how the emission trading system is uh, composed uh, and, and uh, how we deal with those distributional effects that are often uh, regressive and hitting the low income people more. So compensations are necessary there. Uh, managing job transitions, that is one of the most important element because uh, uh, even in sectors that are not directly, so to say, uh, threatened by downscaling, like for example, mining, uh, but even expensive, uh, so expansive sectors like the construction sector uh, or, or public services, that will also go through a fundamental restructuring and, and well, no job will remain the same as it was before. So uh, we have to pay attention to how to manage these job transitions uh, in a, a fair way. And that is probably the most important part. Uh, and of course, this is also linked to regional um, um, uh, uh, restructuring and regional policy. Uh, then, uh, well, uh, I would, one thing, well, I mentioned one thing, uh, we have also a vision perspective. What is the vision in a just transition to a zero carbon economy? The vision is to have a inclusive zero carbon economy at the end of this process. That means that a, a zero carbon world where we are within the planetary limits but at the same time, it's a more equal society than the, the, the one we are. So the first uh, element was not to create further inequalities. That's the minimum uh, by the green transition. 
But of course, we also have to take care of old entrenched inequalities and repair them. So it's a process of repairing old uh, in inequalities and not creating new ones. So it's, it's really amb ambitious. Uh, at the same time, of course, uh, the transition takes place in a real environment. It is not in an imaginary world, yeah? in an in a, in a ideal world. It takes place uh, uh, at workplaces, uh, uh, everyday situations, and these are further on determined by the capital labor relationship and is dominated by capital. Uh, so uh, uh, that means that even if there is no conflict between environmental and social objectives at the workplace level, where these processes uh, happen, there it's a conflicting environment. We know very well uh, with, with the uh, precarious uh, jobs, with the insecurity, everyday insecurity, uh, the threats. It is not an environment that is kind of supporting change. You, you, you tend to cling what you have because then you are afraid uh, what uh, when uh, uh, you can lose. So I mean uh, that is the environment we are working with, and and trade unions uh, have a key role in that. Uh, trade unions actually had an eminent role uh, in managing restructuring in the past, and they have a lot of competence on that. But that uh, that uh, that uh, part of that uh, role was in a different context because. Uh, if there is technological change, the restructuring, downscaling of jobs, uh, relocations, uh, etc., then trade unions also questioned the uh, reason of change. Why to have more profits and then downscale the jobs? So the questions were also addressing the legitimacy of the change and were often also against the change. This is, of course, not the case now, because the change we are facing now to decarbonize the economy is a common interest. So it, it makes also trade unions uh, their traditional uh, role uh, in managing restructuring more complicated, because uh, they need to support the change, even move the change ahead with more ambition, but at the same time, take care that the workers who are affected by this change are not uh, the losers. Uh, so it's a double uh, 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 kind of role, which it's difficult. And that's why, of course, we have, um, uh, it's not an easy thing for trade unions. And, and what we see is, of course, that there are very different ways how trade unions deal with this. It depends on sector, it depends on the economy. If it's a conflictual economy or a cooperative one, Germany and France, uh, for example, quite different, uh, also in the sense how trade unions uh, uh, deal with these changes. But if we go further in the global um, um, uh, environment, then, then, then we see even more uh, difficult examples. Uh, what we also see is that trade unions at the global, international, or European level are very much clear on ambitious climate policy targets and are the main drivers. Uh, uh, trade unions at sectoral level are like steel or mining or, or, or automobile are often more cautious. Uh, and, and, and that is, uh, of course, no wonder. Uh, th there is a typology of trade union um, uh, attitudes and behaviors in the literature. Uh, there is talk about business unions, social unionism, um, uh, and, and also how, how uh, trade union policies can be transactional or hedging or, or uh, I'm not talking about this now. It is of course uh, very interesting and, uh, and needs to be uh, put to discussion. Uh, but two it's two also... minutes, uh, Bella. Yes, how many minutes? Two minutes. Two, very nice. Yeah. Uh, so I uh, mean, uh, so to round up the whole thing and now I don't want, I don't speaking about sectors like automobile or mining, or energy intensive industries or public services, they all have their specifics and just transition in all these sectors are quite different. And, and, and what we see at the European level now with the just transition mechanism, that it is very limited, it is very narrow, it is very one dimensional, practically it is a core transition fund. And, 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 and we need to, to have a much broader perspective with, with more resources. 
And finally, the last thing, and that would be the, the, the outlook that uh, in order that this happens with a responsible state, uh, with uh, responsible employers and active uh, trade unions, uh, the way to a zero carbon society in a just transition requires a new approach of, uh, of, of the way uh, the state is functioning and we need a new uh, concept for the welfare state. The welfare state as we know it had been founded uh, uh, well on basis of uh, energy intensive and growth based uh, production and consumption. Uh, this we need uh, uh, well uh, to redefine it and also that to make it more uh, well comprehensive, uh, including different uh, labor market policies than, than what we have. Labor market policies, they are supporting change uh, and also that are providing, well, a basic uh, livelihood to everybody. So this, this would be the next thing uh, to think about. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is what I wanted to say in the first round. Thank you so much, Bella, for this very inspiring uh, presentation, which, which gives us a really horizon to this uh, new social ecological welfare state. Uh, our next speaker is Dean uh, Strud. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dean is not able to, to attend and to be part of this uh, live meeting, but he just uh, sent us the, the recording of his presentation. I will just introduce him. Uh, Dean is a senior lecturer uh, from Cardiff University who is teaching and researching in the area of skills and workforce uh, development. Uh, his presentation will focus on the findings of a, a project, uh, a European project on energy efficiency in energy intensive industries. Uh, and, and he will talk about uh, in this uh, uh, presentation, he will talk about the, the just transition implications of the inclusion of a green innovation uh, within uh, industrial processes. So, uh, Sylviane, could you just display us the presentation? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to present at the ETUI ETUC conference towards a new socio-ecological contract. Apologies for not being able to present in person or through Zoom. At least but it was not possible for me to be here or there. First, I would like to say a little about myself. I'm a lecturer and researcher based at Cardiff University School of Social Sciences and research and publish in the areas of skills and workforce development, also industrial relations, technological change and digitalization and the greening of work and employment. The majority of my work is focused on the European steel industry. My current project is the European Steel Skills Agenda, or ESSA, which is an Erasmus Plus funded sector skills alliance project working towards a blueprint for meeting future skill steel industry skill needs. It involves all major industry stakeholders, and we're pictured here at a meeting in Brussels, and includes trade unions and the Trade Union Federation Industrial as an associate partner. What I'm going to be talking to you about today is the results of the WaterWatt project, which started in 2016 and ended in 2019. WaterWatt was funded by the European Commission's Horizon 2020 programme and focused on improving the energy efficiency of industrial water circuits, or IWCs, 
in energy intensive industries like steel, but we also looked at paper and pulp, chemicals, food and beverages and oil refining. The project focused on both technical innovations for improving the efficiency of IWCs, but also innovations focused on, more, on the more social aspects and what was described in the project as human factors, including how work might be better organised for reducing energy use. A key aspect of the proposal was to innovate in the direction of digital gamification as a way of changing workers' behaviours and attitudes towards energy efficiency. We discussed with management, workers and trade unions the implications and potential for, it on, uh, for um, inserting such an innovation within the energy intensive industries and our findings from the steel industry in particular provide the focus uh, for a paper in a special issue of the European Journal of Industrial Relations which is edited by Linda Clark and Carla lipsig mame on industrial relations aspects of greening. The paper is informed by wider developments of Industry 4.0 and the emergence of big data, smart factories and so on, the digitalisation of the workplace. The potential implications for work and employment of this transition are much documented and it's not immediately, immediately evident what the outcomes will be, but jobs will be lost, they will be gained and work will be upskilled and de-skilled as a result of such innovations. Digitalisation presents one of the twin challenges facing workers and trade unions with industry, suggesting it promises a business model transformation. The second of the twin challenges is greening. This also promises significant changes to the way people work and the loss of some jobs and development of others. For example, the displacement of workers from energy industries based on extraction to those based on wind and waves. The European Commission has set targets for the improvements in energy efficiency and regulations are in place to ensure that industry, industry innovates and trades its way towards a sustainable low carbon production. Of course, this might provide a double dividend for workers as jobs are saved as industry becomes more viable and the benefit of a living in a greener environment. But there is the potential for costs too, and this is the question we ask. Gamification is a managerial strategy for changing the behaviour of workers. Essentially, it employs game elements and fun in non-game environments, such as the workplace, to target worker behaviours. In this case, the aim is to reduce energy use by technicians and operators by, encourage, by encouraging um, them to compete or collaborate for achieving the highest performance towards reducing energy usage. This then encourages more energy efficient behaviours. The Walter Watt innovation was for digital gamification and to introduce the concept of gamification within a digital mobile application, such as on a smartphone, and to motivate workers to improve their behaviours on energy efficiency and achieve virtual rewards and improve their place on a leaderboard in competition with co-workers. The European steel industry is, of course, a highly intensive industry in terms of energy use usage. It is a green industry in the respect that it that its product is 100% recyclable, but the high use of energy to produce the necessary temperatures uh, to make steel is clear, not to speak of the associated carbon emissions and pollution. It is also an industry experiencing much rationalization and restructuring over recent decades and driven by technological innovation. The result today is, for a, um, is the need for a much smaller workforce that is also asked to work smarter the industry innovates to reduce emissions and energy use, with regulations forming something of a beneficial constraint. Alongside te technological innovations, such as recycling of process gases, Walter Watt, uh, and Walter Watt's uh, online platform for modelling IWC optimization, there are also innovations aimed at the workforce, such as team working. Digital gamification is an innovation in line with efforts to ensure workers optimise their ways of working. To help understand what it might mean for workers to introduce gamification, we interviewed a range of industry stakeholders, including those managing and working within steel plants, those representing worker interests and, and as well as observers of the industry. We focused on three plants, one each in Germany, Norway and the UK. Our, our analytical frame for the paper is varieties of capitalism, and essentially we're commenting on how different sets of institutional complementarities for the firm 
or for firm activities shapes attitudes towards innovation. In this respect, we contrast the potential for innovation in countries where the market has a greater intermediary role in structuring patterns of skill formation, innovation and, and industrial relations, such as the UK as a liberal market economy, when compared to countries such as Germany and Norway, where strong networks of social institutions regulate economic action within the market. What we must always keep in mind is that innovation is not socially neutral and it will always have effects on the material realities of work and employment. Hence, as with within service sector industries, uh, which tend to be the more typical site for gamification measures, we find the raising of similar concerns within manufacturing, particularly with regard to gamification in its digital form. Here there is a risk of digital surveillance and in this way avenues for data valence um, of digital trails in workers' use and performance through the gamification app. This provides new opportunities for top-down performance management, but also the self-tracking of performance and the anxieties this might produce, as well as new avenues for control, competition, intensification and conditioning. Of course, it, it will be difficult for workers to refuse to work with technologies and approaches designed to make for greener performance. But the threat is that digital technologies may dis display function creep, meaning that whilst workers may consent to the gathering of data over green issues, if the performance data come to be used for other purposes, the initial consent may never have been given. At the same time, we must not see an in inevitability to dig digital technologies that make us a hostage to fortune, and as Wiseman puts it, make us mere hostages to the accelerating drive of machines. There is room for a new social contract and a, a just transition based on digitalization and greening. In this respect, we find that workers and their representatives recognize the dangers of gamification and the enhanced capacity for increasing responsabilization and shifting accountability for energy efficiency, increased performance monitoring, embedding competition in the workplace and increased surveillance, for which data protection is important but at present it is not clear that it is fit for purpose on some digital technologies, including digital gamification. What we note is that where trust relations are more developed, for example, in patterns of work organization and employment relations, as they seem to be in Germany and Norway, and where participative arrangements and consultation mechanisms seem to be stronger, then such innovations and their negative implications are more readily questioned. And this quote on the uh, uh, right hand of the slide demonstrates this. In the UK, trade unions also recognise the issues that such innovations might raise, but in the particular context of liberal market economies and the specific circumstances of, of the plant we visited, which was suffering innovation fatigue, cost cutting and work intensification, the mechanisms and space for engagement on the innovation is much more circumscribed than within the coordinated market economy contexts. Of course, innovation is necessary for meeting the climate emergency, and in this particular case, improving um, on energy efficiency. But it strikes me that the combination of digitalization and greening present twin challenges for the development and negotiation of a new social contract, as well as highlighting the need for a new social contract. It is imperative that we avoid reductionist solutions where innovation and greening are concerned. What the Walter Watt research suggests is that we need to pay attention to what is happening in different parts of Europe and learn lessons about the effects of innovation and the context within which they are introduced. This will help us, this will help us inform, help inform us about um, what a new social contract should look like. The country effect is clearly informative of the industrial relations landscape and the management of digital innovations for greening. And it is this which might determine whether there is a, a double dividend for workers and a socially just transition, or whether there is quite simply a cost to workers in meeting industry's twin challenges. Please feel free to contact me at this email address to ask questions about this paper or any of the projects that um, I've been involved in, um, including ESSA, and this is the website, and the WaterWatt project, and this is the website address that project as well. Thank you. 
So thank you, thank you, Dean. Thank you for this uh, uh, presentation and this recording. Uh, it's uh, actually a real pleasure for me to, to introduce now uh, our next speaker, uh, Noha Hatzel. Uh, Noha is Professor Emerita at the Department of Sociology of the University of uh, EMEA uh, in Sweden. And Noha has researched uh, extensively uh, trade union policies and practices towards environmental degradation in countries of the global South and North, as well as working relations in transnational corporations, gender and ethnic relations. Uh, together with other colleagues, uh, Noha uh, has been uh, developing uh, the area, the quite new areas, I should say, of environmental labor studies, which uh, explores the environmental policies of actors of work, and amongst them, uh, trade unionists. The title of her presentation is uh, Social Movement Unions, Unionism sorry, uh, and the Crisis of Life, Perspectives for a Just Transition with Workers as Actors, Not Victims. Noha, up to you. Okay, thank you very much. I think I can speak, but I cannot put on my video, but I will try to share the screen nevertheless. No, it's not my screen. I don't know. Can you perhaps put me in a position that I can change my, ah, okay, there it is. Right, thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for having me here. I'm going to start quickly so that I can use my 12 minutes at best. Oops, I cannot move my, I cannot move my, uh, my PowerPoint. I don't know why. Ah, okay. So what I'm going to say is based on research projects that were funded in Sweden. I'm not going into details because I'm already have been losing some time. We did research on trade unions, the environmental policies in Sweden, in the UK, in Spain, in Brazil, in South Africa and in India. And we interviewed, as you see, a lot of organizations, workers' organizations across the world. Also, uh, this is based on knowledge that we gained by editing a handbook of environmental labor studies, which has 36 chapters uh, about environmental practices, policies, resistances of industrial workers, trade unionist peasants, indigenous populations, small farmers and fisher folk, in uh, different parts of the world, Asia, Africa, Europe, South America, North America. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use an example of trade union just transition plan to ask a few questions. I don't want this to be seen as a critique, but more as a broadening of perspectives. So I hope it's a broadening. Um, and I will quote from a just transition plan from a trade union, doesn't matter which one it is, it says, the transition will trigger positive effects. From a worker's perspective, the transition will profoundly reshape the labor market in ways that creates both new risks and new opportunities for workers. And what trade unions can do is anticipating these trends and their impact on workers. That's at the heart of their activities. And also climate governance offers an opportunity for trade unions to increase their understanding of the ongoing changes and their influence on climate policy. So the problem that I have with this kind of uh, framing the just transition is that it appears as if the transition is actually the problem and that all that trade unions can do is to look at the trends that are being produced by the just transition and see how they can use them in a positive way for workers. So the problem that I see is, first of all, who are the actors? It seems the transition is actually the actor and the trade unions are just reacting to it. And this creates a certain logic for negotiations so that you're sitting at the negotiation table 
looking at this just transition that is coming towards you. And what you have to negotiate is to make it as positive as possible and as little damaging as possible. So this is a kind of negotiation logic that makes you say, okay, can we have a few more years of coal so that we can keep our jobs, our coal jobs a few more years. I think that is problematic and we can discuss that. And there is another view of the problem that is possible, namely to see the whole thing, the problem as the nature, labor, life crisis. We have all seen the results and the impact of climate change or climate crisis as we keep calling it now. And I'm not going to go into details, just to give you an overview to remind you of all the effects that we're going to see in the future and we're already seeing. But what are the causes of climate crisis? We're used to see these images, you know, the fossil fuels, the CO2 emissions, but there is more. There is crop feed, there is um, large hand, large uh, cattle grazing areas and there is deforestation. And to sum this up, the total land for land grazing is 26% of ice-free land surface. The pastures and rangelands that are degraded by overgrazing are 20% of all the total pasture and rangeland. And the total land in feed crops uses 33% of all the arable land deforestation, we've cut 1 billion hectare forests in the last 40 years. And in 78 years, if we go on like that, there will be no more rainforests. But that's not all. COVID-19, it's not just wet markets in China because all the causes for climate change are also causes for a pandemic. And I quote, we invade tropical forests and other wild landscapes which harbor so many species of animals and plants and within those creatures so many unknown viruses. We disrupt ecosystems and we shake viruses loose from their natural hosts. When that happens, they need a new host. Often we are the new host and we can feel that now. Oh, I have to click here to go further. So what is the result? Humans are just 1.01% of all life on earth, but we have already destroyed 83% of wild mammals. 60% of all the mammals are livestock, 36% of all the mammals are humans, and only 4% are left, which are wild mammals. 70% of all the birds are already chickens and all the poultry we eat. And as you can see on the left-hand side of the scale, 83% of wild mammals have been destroyed, 80% of marine mammals, 50% of plants, and 15% of fish through human activity. And it goes on, the demand for wood, minerals, and resources from the global north leads to the degraded landscapes and ecological disruption that drives the disease. So this is another way of creating a pandemic. And our five minutes left. We have not just a climate crisis. Five minutes left? Okay, I have to be very quick. Not just a biodiversity crisis. It's not just a pandemic. And I'm saying that because we know all these things, but we discuss them in different departments. We compartmentalize them. And what we have to see is that we have a crisis of life on earth and that our mode of production is actually a mode of destruction. So growth sectors, I have to be very quick now. We think of green growth, but it's a an oxymoron, because if we say we can have a circular economy, we have to take into consideration that only 30% of the economy can in fact be circular. Recycling and efficiency. Here you see the green dots are where you have more than 50% recycling in a smartphone, the red dots where you have less than 1%. Finally, if energy is used, all the energy we use today 
If they would be harnessed from renewable energy, this would exceed the reserves of cobalt, lithium, and nickel we have on Earth. And I will just, you can just have a look at this graph. I don't have the time again to go into details. So there is also in all these mining a cost for workers' lives. There is a cost for nature. If we have everything in renewable energy, it could look like that. Where are we going to have a walk in the green? So trade unions say we have to protect workers, their family and their communities. And that is absolutely necessary. But in my view, it is not enough. We need a broader path to a just transition in which workers are not victims, not just re reacting to trends, but actually defining the trends. Can that happen? It can happen if we see workers at researchers. Workers in the world are already connected. They can research to understand the value chain of which they are a part. Look at extraction process, the working conditions, the environmental impacts, the transport systems, and then act together in order to convert production to create socially useful products in line with the needs of people and nature. It's not just trade unions negotiating, that is very important, but workers themselves have the skills and the ingenuity to think about alternative forms of production. This is an example of the Lucas Aerospace workers who did this in the 70s, but there are also workers today fighting for not just keeping their job, but changing them into different jobs that are environmentally sound. So what we need to do, I think, is think about how we can depart from the growth model in rich countries, produce less. What do we really need? Reduce paid working hours, have a universal basic income to compensate reduced paid employment. Workers creating themselves meaningful and satisfactory work that develops their capability and is socially useful and not just being pacified receivers of goodwill by governments and by other organizations. Share paid and unpaid work fairly between the genders, consume less, use the free time for other kinds of creative activities. Also in the South, we need to depart from destructive production models in so-called poorer countries. Here are people from those countries saying there are no poor countries. There are only looted countries, exploited countries, enslaved countries, no poor countries. So what we also need is to support people who are fighting and resisting extractivism and the looting of their territories. Therefore, we need to democratize the international trade union movement, workers' global solidarity. I'm not going to read the quotes because I don't have time for that, but those were workers from the global south saying that they don't feel that in international trade unions, they have the same voice and the same standing as trade unionists from the Northern countries. So to sum up, a social movement unionism is one that resists victimization, includes workers themselves and their community in developing alternatives, which develop workers' capabilities and produce socially useful and environmentally sound products, which act in solidarity with workers, peasants, food workers across the globe, and which see nature as an ally, not as an object to be exploited. I wanted to end with this Gandhi less, uh, sentence, we must live simply so that others can simply live. But actually this is the last slide, but I do have second thoughts now about it because what does it mean? Some people can choose to live simply so that others there can simply live or survive. I think we should have a world where all of us can choose to live simply so that we can simply live together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Noah, for this, uh, for this presentation. And to remind, to, to remind us the decisive role that uh, workers should play in this uh, just transition. 
So now uh, I will just introduce our, our last speaker, uh, Lean Olsen. Um, Lean is a senior program and operations specialist at uh, the ILO's Bureau for Workers Activities, uh, what we call ACTRAV. And more particularly, she works in the department uh, of the ILO working with uh, trade unions. Uh, during her presentation, Lynn will present her uh, ILO guidelines uh, on just transition, and more precisely, she will answer the following question. Can the concept of just transition provide inspiration for a new social ecological welfare state? Lynn, up to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Franklin, and uh, good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, as, as Franklin said, uh, I would like to, to reflect a little bit about the question whether the concept of just transition can provide inspiration for a new socio-ecological contract, because we have heard a lot about this concept of, of just transition. Uh, and my, my short answer to this is, is yes, then followed yes, but. And then uh, arises a few more uh, questions which I would like to, to reflect on, on, on here, and, and particularly three. Uh, first, which concept are we talking about? Second, how is it going to inspire? And thirdly, what would be important for a new socio-ecological uh, contract? Uh, and while reflecting on this question, I would also argue for the use of the ILO guidelines for a just transition towards environmentally sustainable economies and societies for all that was adopted uh, in 2015. And I would, I would argue that these guidelines uh, can be tools to answer these questions. And uh, I will not repeat that very long title of those guidelines in my presentation, so I will refer to them uh, as guidelines only. So taking the, the concept first, uh, a lot has been said about just transition and, and the use of the terminology we have seen has grown exponentially in the last uh, decades. And, um, but as the previous panelists have highlighted, the, the concept of, of just transition <clears throat> is not defined and used in a similar manner by, by all. And that is really why the uh, ILO guidelines for a just transition are extremely important. Uh, these guidelines provide a detailed description of what really constitutes uh, a just transition. And I would say that they uh, provide a good and comprehensive defi definition of the concept, even though uh, quite a long one, 23 pages to be correct. <laughs> and. Um, Paragraph uh, four of these guidelines capture well, uh, I think, the overall goal of the transition. And I would like to quote that paragraph. A just transition for all towards an environmentally sustainable economy needs to be well managed and contribute to the goals of decent work for all, social inclusion, and the eradication of poverty, end of quote. And, and the guidelines also include a vision, uh, a, uh, guiding principles, and also key policy areas, nine in total, and which I would like to mention because this is important. Uh, macroeconomic and growth policies, industrial and sectoral policies, enterprise policies, skills policies, occupational health and safety policies, social protection, active labor market policies, rights, and social dialogue and, and tripartism. They also include an annex, these guidelines, which uh, lists some international labor standards and resolutions that are relevant for a just transition framework. And I will come back uh, to, to this. Having said that, of course, there is not one size fits, fits all. And the e ingredients, if you like, uh, can be um, treated in different manners in different countries. It's like a common uh, recipe for baking an apple cake. You may add a few personal uh, touches, but of course the apples uh, should go in. So um, some ingredients are really uh, essential. Uh, another element which is important uh, about the ILO guidelines 
is that they have been developed and agreed upon by the tripartite constituents of the ILO, representatives from governments, workers, and employers' organizations. And this means that the concept really has a common and wide uh, ranging support. Uh, the, the, the guidelines highlights that social dialogue is a precondition for a just transition. And this is really repeated in the vision, in the guiding principles, and in the policy uh, areas. And the role of social partners is really crucial. And as other panelists have said, they are not passive bystanders, but rather agents of change, not reacting, but really being part of, of, of developing um, new solutions. This leads me to the second question. How is it going to inspire the concept of, 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 um, of just transition? First, I think it has already inspired quite a lot. First of all, it has inspired the trade union movement from which the concept uh, uh, initiates. It has inspired to bring different groups together, trade unionists, environmentalists, governments, businesses, and, and other. And uh, the fact that it really speaks to all is, is important. And, and this is the core of, of the ILO guidelines. It calls for a holistic approach with policy coherence and with uh, involvement of all stakeholders at, at all levels for developing and developed countries alike and for a just transition in all sectors, not only the energy sectors and the mining community, as we often hear uh, a lot about. We have, uh, as we know, uh, also seen that the just transition concept has been integrated in the Paris Agreement. And it is supported now by uh, numerous institutions, organizations, and, and, and uh, initiatives. Uh, more than 46 countries have actually committed to place both jobs uh, and uh, climate change action at the heart of, uh, of their policies and to promote uh, a just transition in the framework of the new UN initiative uh, on, on climate change for, for jobs. This initiative is spearheaded by the ILO and brings together governments, employers and workers organizations, but also international institutions, academia and, and civil society to deliver this, this change. The concept of just transition can also further inspire by building on this current coalition to increase workers and people's voices in democratic processes and, and institutions. And this is important to further the ILO, for, so, sorry, to further the idea of a shift towards a, a significantly different and more just society. Uh, and I would like to cite a, a global poll commissioned by the International Trade Union Confederation last year, uh, covering 63 uh, countries representing 56% of the global population. And this poll showed that almost 63% believe working people have too little influence, too little. Uh, and this, but the same poll shows that both climate change and the impact of new te technology weighs really heavily on the minds of the global population. However, uh, the same numbers thinks that um, government should do more to promote a just transition to a zero carbon uh, future. And the ILO guidelines do promote this democratic participation in decision making and is also highlighting uh, the international labor standards related to this freedom of association and the right to uh, collective bargaining. This, this leads me to the third question. What would be important for a new socio-ecological uh, contract? Well, policy coherence, commitment, and continuity. The ILO guidelines provides a list of nine policy areas that I mentioned to be included in a coherent policy framework to address challenges of a just transition for all. And it is based on the concept of sustainable develop development addressing not only the economic, but also the social 
and an environmental dimension of the transition with, with equal importance and in an interrelated manner. We do not only want a green transition, but also one that provides decent work and social, uh, social justice. And by doing this and ensuring ownership by, um, uh, by participation of all relevant stakeholders, the commitment to just transition can be uh, achieved. And finally, uh, we need political continuity. And this might be uh, challenging when we are putting in place broad uh, range, uh, ranging new policies. And however, in order to ensure sustainability and, and guarantee continuity over time, uh, uh, commitment across political views and independent of political cycle is, is, is very important. And uh, the international labor standards are useful in, in this regard. As I mentioned initially, uh, the ILO guidelines on just transition includes a list of international standards and resolution that might be relevant in the just transition framework. And the ratification and implementation of these standards would constitute, I think, a safeguard to ensure continuity uh, of social rights uh, in the transition. And in addition, the ILO supervisory mechanisms would serve as a tool to monitor the compliance with these uh, regulations. In two minutes. Yeah, thank you. So developing a convention uh, on just transition has been raised in the ILO. Uh, however, there has been um, not much support for this except from the workers group. So it's important that we use the existing international labor standards uh, to work uh, in relation to, uh, to just transition. And uh, my last message, let the concept of just transition accompanied by the guidelines and the IL international labor standards inspire us all, inspire us to participate, to collaborate, and to use other voices in democratic processes and institutions. And I think this is essential for a new social ecological contract to be established. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn, for this uh, presentation, which closed very well, I think, our, 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 our panel here. Uh, before I give the floor to uh, the uh, audience, I would just like to ask you all of you uh, a, a general question. Uh, when I hear your, your, your speeches, I've really the feeling that workers should be, must be at the center of this uh, just transition uh, toward this new social ecological uh, uh, contract. So my, my question is the following. According to you, what are the key challenges trade unions movement need to address to make sure that these workers uh, become really active actors in this uh, paradigm shift to uh, this uh, new social ecological uh, welfare state. Who likes to, to take the floor? I can say something if nobody else wants to say something. Please no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's a privilege, but I, I can go on to explain what I wanted to say in the short presentation, I think a very important uh, perspective is to see workers as possible resources and actors of change. Because at the moment, uh, what we all do is we see, okay, how can we avoid workers being hurt? How can we educate them about what climate change is? How can we try to develop them to get new skills because their old skills will not be useful anymore? And I think, although those are all uh, reasonable questions, at the same time, there are questions which construct workers as objects of our intelligent strategies. You know, and what was so um, inspiring of the Lucas Aerospace Workers Actions in the year 77. And uh, they, they, that 
they they were nominated for the Peace Prize and it went all over the world and people are still speaking about it. When their jobs were threatened because they wanted to close down the factories, they didn't go on strike. Well, I'm not, I have nothing against strikes, okay? But they said, no, the company wants us to go out of work anyway. So what we're going to do, we're going to develop a plan. How? With our knowledge, with our machines, with our tools, with our materials, we can produce other things that are not arms, that are useful, that are useful for society. And even in the 70s, they already thought about to produce things that are environmentally sound. So I think what is needed is a big um, effort of all trade unions to go to their members and see them not at the objects of good policies, but as people who have ideas and can use their skills in order to produce something else. Thank you, thank you, Nora. Would like to to comment or Bella, please? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yes, um, I fully agree uh, with Nora. Um, uh, just adding that. What is also crucial is that um, democracy at workplace uh, and um, active participation uh, of workers in in uh, managing this process. That means also uh, in a decision making process, in 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 strategy uh, development. Uh, and whereas uh, in certain countries, this is. Uh, a good practice, but it's by far not true for all for the countries uh, uh, we know. So it also needs uh, um, enabling environment. So this is kind of the policy uh, uh, framework to to foster uh, democracy at the workplace and to enable. Uh, workers' participation uh, to play a uh, um, yeah um, a higher role, and trade unions need also uh, to de develop uh, new strategies. In many cases, when we talk about just transition for all, that also means that a focus on members only is not enough. Trade unions also need to think beyond their members. Uh, and uh, this is uh, 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 one important issue. Then seeking alliances uh, with uh, other uh, actors, uh, with uh, civil society. Yeah, so much. Thank you, thank you, Bella. Lean, uh, please up to you. Yes, no, I would, I would uh, also um, add to the challenge regarding participation and, and uh, follow up on what Bella said about the enabling environment. Of course, for the participation, you need functioning institutions uh, with, the, of course, the participation of all the stakeholders. And uh, so social dialogue institution and platforms to drive the transition at all levels are, are important. But as we heard from, from some trade unionists this, this morning, uh, trade unionists are not always invited to the table when policies are discussed or implemented. So this is also an important, uh, important factor. Uh, and uh, uh, within uh, the ILO, we, we have, <clears throat> uh, to give an example, we have uh, uh, made a global trend analysis, analysis on the role of trade unions in times of, of COVID-19 and, and looked at uh, how unions were involved in both the measures put in place and, and also you know, beyond uh, for, for the recovery. And we have seen that the tripartite dialogue between governments, trade unions, and employers organizing took place in 79 out of the 133 countries that we uh, looked at. So that's 59%. So it could still be improved and it's important in the recovery and beyond that we are really uh, looking at this, uh, this challenge. And as, as, as Bella said, there is also 
um, 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 important that the trade unions are also uh, reaching out uh, and organizing. We have seen in some countries um, uh, organization um, diminished during the, the, the pandemic and, and even before the pandemic. So there is also a challenge there to reach out to new, uh, to new members, uh, organizing new members, but also providing services to new members and particularly in the new uh, green jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I think that we'll go a little bit deeper into this, uh, I mean, uh, question of the role of trade unions and I have here uh, in the, uh, a very interesting question uh, from the, the uh, whole, uh, participant asking what role could or should trade union communication via union owned media, traditional media mass or social media, what trade union communication could play, what role they could play, sorry, in convincing workers, trade union members and the broader public to get actively involved in shaping the just transition. Would like to answer this uh, very, very interesting question. Oh, please. You want... So? Yeah, Bella. Okay, well, uh, if, if, um... If nobody was, yes, uh, I, I mean, yes, communication uh, is uh, extremely important. And um, uh, what we also learned is that uh, communication through different channels uh, at the same time. Uh, so that means influencing uh, public opinion, uh, policy makers, uh, and of course, uh, motivate and uh, bring uh, their own membership uh, uh, base. Yeah, this means a um, strategy that is uh, diverse. Yeah, so they, they need to apply all the uh, channels available. So including social media, of course, and 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 uh, play a role. And then also uh, focusing on the workplace. So workplace transitions not only mean uh, that jobs are changing and uh, uh, restructuring is happening, but, but uh, contribute to greener workplaces, uh, the way of the daily operation, uh, and there to uh, have a, an active role uh, to, to, yeah. Play. So that's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Bella. Uh, Noha, you'd like to, to add something? Um, I, I, I agree, of course, with what Bella has said. And, <coughs> uh, but I think the question also, sorry if I say that, also has a little bit of a tendency again to, you know, how can we address workers? with what we know is best. And I think it is important to, trans to think about, rethink the idea that we know best and we have to educate them and communicate to them. There is a lot of things that is work uh, happening in the workplace that we don't know about. And uh, if, I want, if I can very quickly talk about my own profession, about researchers, you know, um, there is a lot of research in educating workers, but there is less research, and maybe that should be a driving force of research funding of learning from workers what they know and what they can contribute to change. And uh, I'm not being naive, you know, I'm not saying that all the workers are fantastic and if the people will speak, everything will be fantastic. We will have conflicts and contradictions all the time. But from research, listening to workers, I, I do have a little bit of experience in the capabilities and ingenuities that exist. So learning from workers as opposed to trying to educate them only and seeing them as researchers of their own 
working process and the global connections which they have. Thank you, Nora. Uh, Lynn, do you like, like to, to add something? Yes, yes. No, I, I think it is an important, uh, an important point. And, and it is also a point which the trade unions are um, um, uh, engaged in. I mean, uh, and, 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 and important for them to, to reach out through different channels and both internally, uh, I mean, uh, from the organization towards the members, but and also externally, as, as Bella said, you know, towards uh, the wider uh, society through social media and, and, and other means. And, and we have in, in the Bureau for uh, Workers' Activities in the ILO and together with uh, unions in different uh, regions and countries organized uh, training activities in relation to this, not only, you know, uh, to, to learn about new tools, but also, um, as Nora said, for the unions themselves to share their views and, and, and their knowledge about these and their experience and how they are using these tools to communicate internally and externally. But I also think we have to be aware that there is still a digital divide. I mean, we are working globally in the ILO and, and uh, there are still uh, a number of, of countries and, and uh, where the access to these digital tools are, are difficult and, and there are still uh, organizations that do not have uh, easily access to, to these tools. And this is something that we have to, have to uh, think about uh, as well. Thank you, thank you, Elaine. I would like just now to, to put the, the, the emphasis and the focus on, on, on the, the new uh, social ecological contract or welfare state uh, with one or two questions. The, the, the first one is uh, what, I mean, uh, what, what are the key ingredients of, or what could be the key ingredient, ingredient of this uh, new social ecological uh, welfare state? And second question, what priorities trade unions could play uh, to deliver on this uh, uh, new uh, welfare state? Nora, please. Bella is a specialist for this, but uh, I will just <laughs> start so that he can think about all the other things that that he could say. I think we need indeed a new uh, social contract and it has to be a social contract. May I say that? That is not based only on work in terms of paid work and paid employment. Because I think if we, if we think about uh, a green, a sustainable society, as I said, showing my graphs, and so I'm not going to go into details here, is we cannot have, we cannot continue with the growth idea. So that means we have to have less employed paid work. And that means that we have to have more citizens um, payment by the state, for instance, in order to make up what people lose when they are employed, let's say, only three days a week. Other people have, have said and are saying things about that in a parallel plan. So how can we construct a future eco-social state? I just was going to say eco-socialist state uh, would be ideal, of course, that is based on sufficiency, what we need, the things we need, and also on globalization and global equality, because what we see now with the vaccine conflicts, I don't know if you're all following this, all the rich countries buying up all the vaccines so that the countries in the global south are going to have a vaccine perhaps in two or three years, you know. And that's saying, oh no, we're all equal, we're going to provide for the poor countries. So a future uh, social, eco-social state has to be not based on paid employment only and has to be global and seeking global justice and equality. Thank you, Nora. Bella, it seems that you, you are the 
specialist on this. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that at all, but uh, we are uh, starting to think about it. And uh, uh, by the way, uh, we will also have a project uh, on developing ideas uh, uh, on um, and approaches uh, towards a new concept of the RAF state. Uh, so we have a project uh, to start soon at the ETI together with uh, the European Climate Foundation. So it's an ongoing process. But uh, indeed, yes, it's, um, first of all, it's important what we see already, and as Nora said, uh, that paid work and the work relationship as we know is changing tremendously. So even if we don't do anything, this change is moving ahead uh, on many fronts. Uh, let it be a digitalization platform work, uh, more diverse forms of employment uh, and indeed probably uh, less uh, work uh, all together uh, and that 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 uh, already uh, challenging the limits of the welfare state as as, as uh, it was established in the 20th century because it was established on a very different principle on mostly uh, uh, organized uh, mass production based uh, labor in yeah, factory work actually uh, was the uh, kind of ideal type. Uh, of course, uh, without any uh, consideration on the environmental impacts on, on and sustainability. So that was kind of the origin. So uh, uh, certainly we will have a big issue uh, with working time uh as possibly uh the overall working hours would shrink how to distribute that uh, more evenly it is a very difficult question so we shouldn't be have illusions about that yeah so we know it only already uh, from normal daily normal daily business that that uh, dealing with unemployment whereas you have huge shortages of labor at the other end and not able to find the matching uh, between labor demand and labor supply uh, is, is quite huge. Uh, it's on, even on the normal circumstances, it's a big issue, but, but then redistribute the whole volume. That means if people would work uh, 20 or 30 percent less but then you have to spread it all over the society it's a tremendous challenge yes so i mean it's uh, it's it's a dramatic change and it needs to be uh, yeah planned and managed properly and trade unions certainly have a, a huge uh, uh, role in that and there are certainly issues about um, uh, well, uh, universal basic income as possible concept uh, and um, yeah, so expanding to the, and, and also, also uh, trying to uh, address, uh, yeah, the employment relationship. Yeah? So because I mean, it is not, not obvious anymore that who is an employer and who is an employee that is more blurred now. So we need to find um, uh, um, instruments that, that, uh, that uh, uh, can tackle this uh, situation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bela. Lynn, do you want to, to add something on this different ingredient for this new, new contract? Yeah, no, I, th I think that international cooperation and, and global action is, is really very important because we have to bear in mind that this is not a national or a, or a regional challenge, but it's not for uh, nations alone or, or even for EU alone, 
but it's a global challenge and, and really requires global global measures and, and I would say global regulation. And I want to, to, to make references to Maria Rao Rodriguez uh, on, on Wednesday in, 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 the, in, the, um, in one of the, 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 the panels uh, on how can we regulate globally and, and, and she said that we will not be able to, to reconstruct and to create a welfare system in the 21st century without a real overhaul of, of, um, of the tax uh, system, and particularly uh, regarding taxation of wealth. Uh, uh, di digital taxes has also been um, uh, pointed out. And, and new research actually suggests that 40% of multinational profits are shifted to tax havens. And this results in, in a $200 billion in lost global tax revenue. And this is enormous. And this is something that we have to, have to address, uh, perhaps through something that has been proposed, a globally agreed minimum corporate tax, uh, tax rate, for instance. But I also think and I come back to the international labor standards in, in terms of regulating at, 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 at global level, respect for international labor standards, uh, ratifying them and then implementing them, of course, are also extremely uh, important at, at, in order to, to create a kind of a level playing field for, for all at, at the global level. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. Uh, I look at uh, here uh, at the, the, the Q and A zone, and I, I see a lot of questions. I mean, a lot of, but some of them uh, around this, uh, the role of trade unions. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, but more precisely, uh, the the role of workers in union uh, regarding this issue of uh, just transition. And I like in this in this uh, sense, I would like. We have still yeah uh, nine minutes left. We, well, I'd like to ask you, uh, what should be the priorities for trade unions movement and to, to deliver on this uh, new contract? And we, we discussed a lot about the, the role of workers. Uh, what, what could be the priorities towards workers in order to deliver this uh, uh, new uh, social ecological uh, welfare state? I can start so that uh, <laughs> other people can criticize. Um, I think one of the things that uh, would be important for unions would be probably to democratize their organizations and their structures in a way that they could introduce more um, what workers think uh, and, and, and what they suggest, because what we see worldwide is a reduction of trade unions' importance. There are less workers that are unionized for many reasons, like we know, because the central um, places of unions in industry is decreasing in the global north, not so much globally. I think globally there are increasing a little bit industrialized workers, but also this um, uh, precarity of work. Bella, you have uh, uh, referred to that, you know, one employer, self-employment and all these kind of crazy ways in which work is organized so that workers cannot, um, cannot become uh, unionized. And I wonder if trade unions could work against those trends that are not of their own making uh, necessarily by thinking more um, what we call so labor, social, social movement unionism in terms of societal transformation, in terms of just transition, not only in terms of transitioning work, we have talked about that and how necessary that is, but also about transitioning 
societies uh, into more democratic and environmentally sound uh, organizations, structures, and systems. If that would be a possibility to make trade unions more interesting for younger people, for people who are more green, and for people who want their voices heard, and also want to have a kind of um, independence. Because although I'm, I'm aware how precarious work means this, you know, the self-employment thing is basically uh, precarization of work so that people think that they are self-employed. But you also find a lot of interest in workers of being independent, even if that is very risky. So how can trade unions relate to these new kinds of challenges in order to work against the fact that they are becoming less powerful in terms of being able to transform the conditions under which they work and fight? Yeah, I would like just to, to quote uh, Sam, and uh, this is uh, the very, our very last question. Do we need a new trade unionism? So, Lina, you want to continue or? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure whether we need, we need a new one, but we, 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 we probably need to strengthen the one we have. Of course, okay, we should also, I mean, uh, look at, at what we have, but as, as Nora said, there is a, a tendency to a decrease in unionization in, in, in many countries, even though, you know, in some countries, as she said, we, we see a, a, an increase. But I mean, there, there, there is a need for unions to renew themselves in terms of also organizing new groups of, of, of workers uh, in, in, well, as I, as I mentioned earlier, in, in new jobs, in new green jobs, those that will be established due to the green transition we might lose, you know, uh, unionized members in sectors that are more heavily, you know, unionized currently. And we have seen that, for instance, in the energy sector. Uh, so uh, we should also, you know, see too that the renewable energy sector are a unionized sector. And then vulnerable groups, uh, informal economy um, is, is, um, is, a, is a big challenge where unions, uh, I would say, in the, in the last uh, years have increased their efforts to also, uh, to also collaborate with informal economy workers association and also having integrated informal economy workers into their range and, and, uh, and creating uh, union organizations specifically for for informal economy uh, workers. And this is extremely important as we know that, that this is um, also growing you know, uh, globally. Um, also, I think sometimes, I think there is a lot of engagement, particularly related to the green agenda by, by, by trade unionists everywhere and at different levels. Sometimes I see that there is perhaps uh, not it, it could be improved that the linkages between the, the different levels, you know, what is going on at enterprise level and what is going on at, at national and, and even at, at global level. There is a huge, um, I would say, huge uh, engagement by unionists on, on, on this, but it can be, you know, uh, better, I think, uh, coordinated uh, between the different levels and also uh, for, for the different levels to know about uh, what is going on, you know, at, at international, uh, national and enterprise uh, level to share the experience and actually to bring, you know, a more coherent, um, you know, view and um, yeah, uh, forward. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Yeah, Bella, please, we have still uh, two minutes. Yeah, indeed. So uh, trade union renewal is uh, very much the uh, demand of the hour. And uh, yes, we only have to see that it's actually quite a challenge. It's quite a big challenge. Uh, 
the sectors that where trade unions are well organized are shrinking. Yeah, so mining was the most organized, uh, almost hundred percent organized uh, sector. That uh, coal mining that will disappear, and and many other sectors where trade union there are trade union strongholds uh, are to shrink, and all. The new job creation happens in a totally different uh, setting, much more decentralized, much more dispersed, uh, and and that's it's a tremendous challenge to 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 organize uh, uh, workers uh, uh, and employees uh, uh, in those sectors. So that that is the major, uh, most important thing. Uh, at the same time. Uh, Trade unions can well depends also very much on the concrete um, labor environment. Uh, how um, trade union strategy can be successful? Uh, first of all, it's really important to to embrace the necessity of this change because. Again, it is not uh, obvious. It is not obvious. Uh, it was always, the temptation is always there that having a slow transition or, or not quite an ambitious transi transition is actually easier to manage. Yeah? So at it, this, this still uh, happens in, in, in uh, many sectors. So here, well, uh, and then of course, um, the challenge is also that uh, many trade union policies were quite much linked to a growth-based economy. And whether we are still having, going to have growth or not, still an open question, but, but certainly, at least in, de in developed economies, slow growth or no growth is more, more and more um, uh, going to be the reality. So all the collective bargaining was always aiming for the redistribution of productivity growth into wage growth. And, and that is still the dominant uh, trade union policy. So there are, and of course, this links us to the working uh, working time uh, debate, the new uh, uh, redistribution of working time, that linked also to a different type of collective bargaining. Uh, so there are lots of issues there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella. Uh, I think that uh, it's now, uh, yeah, let's see, 3, 3 p.m. So uh, it was really a pleasure for me to, to, uh, to be with you today. Uh, thank you, Noha. Thank you, Bella, Lynn. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the participants. Uh, I think that we have a really fruitful, very inspiring discussion. And uh, I hope uh, you have enjoyed this, uh, this moment with us. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you to all. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. It's good to see you again. Bye bye. Bye, bye Bella. Ciao. Bye, Lena. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.